Welcome to The Mortarboard, the administrator's source for solutions in higher education. We tell you about challenges other schools have faced, benchmark the problem, share their best practices and epic fails, and invite you to consider whether what worked for them might also work at your institution. Hosted by longtime college president Dr. Dan Barwick, this is The Mortarboard, the source for solutions in higher education. Welcome to The Mortarboard, your source for solutions in higher education. I'm Dan Barwick. Welcome to the podcast. If the content of this podcast interests you, then you'll enjoy my new book, Risk and Reward, How Small Colleges Get Better Against the Odds. It's now available from Amazon in ebook, paperback, and audiobook format. The best way to find it is to head over to my blog, mortarboardblog.com, and click on the link on the front page. If you have any thoughts about the book, don't hesitate to send me an email and let me know what you think. Welcome to the first episode of Season 4 of The Mortarboard. I'm grateful to our listeners. Without you, the show just wouldn't be possible. Today I'll be doing Part 1 of a two-part series on changes to tenure in American higher education. But first, I've recently been asked by podcast listeners about the issue of free community college, so I thought that I'd share some of my thoughts with you. In President Biden's recent speech to a joint session of Congress, he called for free community college, a movement that's been building for years. Unsurprisingly, My background informs many of my views on this topic. I've been a faculty member at several different community colleges. I still teach a few courses at a a community college as an adjunct. Many of my closest friends also teach at community colleges. And I was the president of a community college for nearly a decade. So first, by way of background and a bit of context. I don't really like the phrase free community college because, of course, it's not really free in the sense that someone pays for it. And yet more accurate ways of discussing it, such as calling it what it is, 100% taxpayer subsidized community college education, can be just plain awkward. I also don't like the phrase free community college because there really aren't any existing proposals that would make it truly free for students. In fact, some proposals are very far from free. The main reason for this is that nearly all proposals focus solely on subsidizing tuition, even though most college students face plenty of other costs when it comes to attending college besides just paying tuition. These costs include fees in the form of both general fees that all students pay and course or activity-specific fees that only some students pay, like, for instance, a specific set of materials for a lab course. Plus, don't forget the cost of books. If you haven't priced educational textbooks in a while, you're in for some serious sticker shock. Textbooks can easily run in hundreds of dollars each. Furthermore, existing proposals do not even consider the cost of room and board at colleges even though currently about 28% of American community colleges offer dorms. And the cost of residential living is high, typically equal to or in some cases even greater than the combined total cost of tuition and fees. Of course, it's, it's easy to simply respond that community college students shouldn't be living on campus and that students should go to the community college in their local community so they can live at home to save money. Yet, while this may work for many people, and maybe even most people, there are also many students that are unable to do this for a variety of reasons. For some students, who are often also the most financially vulnerable students, living at home may not be a safe or healthy option. For other students, the local community college might not be a good option, simply because not all community colleges offer all curricula, and the curricula offered locally may not meet the educational needs of an individual student. For example, if you want to be, say, a veterinary technician, you may not be able to find that curriculum at your local community college, even though it is available at a community college a couple of hundred miles away. In addition, there are other real-world cost situations that existing proposals for free community college don't take into consideration. Such as, for example, 
parents needing to pay for childcare while in class, or students who need to scale back their work hours to attend school. Still, those are situations that apply to students in very specific cases, and in fact, the proposals for a free community college would likely reduce the cost of college attendance for many students. That said, there are two policy-based concerns that cause me to be a bit wary about the concept of free community college. First, I think it sounds a lot better than it actually is. As I've already described, current proposals wouldn't actually make community college free for many students. Second, more significant, is the fact that governmental assistance for our most financially vulnerable students already exists in the form of Pell Grants. The Pell Grant system is already designed to cover more educational expenses for needy students than any of the free community college programs that have been proposed and can even cover costs like living expenses for low-income students attending college. The Pell Grant system is a large, effective program for funding college for people who truly need that money to go to college, and a continuous expansion and improvement of that program would likely do more to help people afford college than the free community college programs that have been proposed. So while the new proposals may sound like a step forward, and may even sound really good on their face, I'm skeptical about the practical economic value of these proposals. Even if I'm wrong, and we are able to implement a proposal for free community college that actually increases the total public financial support for higher education, I'm still concerned that providing free community college may actually worsen what I regard as the chief problem facing American higher education today, the low personal and social return on investment that comes about as a result of the ever-increasing cost of higher education. Higher education in America is runaway expensive, and while these high costs don't always manifest as a direct expense to the student, even those costs that are not passed along to the student are paid by someone. With, with over 6,000 higher education institutions in the United States, American higher education is a highly fragmented system that continues to spend more and more to recruit a shrinking pool of students, which means more and more money that is spent on higher education and is not going toward the direct costs of providing students with an education. And make no mistake, this is not just a matter of a slight financial inefficiency. The American higher education system produces real financial waste that we are only beginning to understand. The Lumina Foundation, one of the largest nonprofit foundations that deals primarily with higher education issues in the United States, has found that American higher education is spending about 50 billion, with a B, billion dollars a year on nothing. It gets nothing in return for the $50 billion investment of money that is spent on maintenance upkeep, utilities for empty classrooms, underused buildings, under-enrolled academic programs, underutilized employees, and debt service on shiny new facilities that fail to actually recruit additional students. The interesting thing about this waste is that it's equivalent to most of the total student loan borrowing in the United States each year. In other words, Students are borrowing money to pay colleges to spend that money on things that result in zero practical educational return on investment. Eliminating that waste could, in theory, eliminate most of the new student loan debt in the United States. If you're interested, I've included a link in the show notes uh, to an interview with the CFO of Lumina that recently aired on my podcast, along with a link to the foundation study on the true cost of overcapacity in American colleges. The truth is that American higher education is already a very heavily subsidized business, subsidized by taxpayers, donors, and lenders, while adding an additional subsidy would certainly show further support for education. And I I don't deny for a minute the desirability of increased support for education. The sad truth is that there's never been an inefficient, 
heavily subsidized system that became more efficient by increasing its subsidy. Am I obsessed with efficiency because I'm all about the money? No, I'm interested in efficiency because at the end of the day, the poor return on investment in American higher education has yielded a system that is viewed with skepticism by students, by the public, by politicians, and even by people who work within higher education, who too often see inexplicably wasteful practices or poor results around them. Finally, I'll say this. If there is a discernible financial movement among the system of community colleges, it is the transfer of financial share from the public to students. Some community colleges are state-supported, some are locally supported, and most are a combination of both. But accounting for inflation, public support for higher education, including community college education, has decreased. With costs increasing faster than inflation, costs have been transferred to students, particularly in the community college space, where donors make up proportionately less of the non-student subsidy. Riddle me this, would we be as focused on decreasing the costs for students if the cost for students hadn't risen so fast and so far? Ultimately, I think the focus on decreasing student costs is just a reaction to the increase in cost that students have faced over the last one to two decades. Put another way, perhaps we wouldn't see a free community college education as so necessary if community colleges were properly financially supported in the first place. The cost pendulum has swung toward students for some time, but pendulums swing both ways. And that's what I think we're seeing here. Ultimately, I believe that increased public financial support of higher education needs to be coupled with efforts to improve outcomes in higher education, because only then will increasing public financial support be sustainable. The creation of an unsustainable system to provide a kind of pseudo-free community college is just breaking a promise to the public, and we can do better than that. Now, let's turn to the subject of today's podcast, tenure, the brass ring that so many academics center their professional lives around for the first three to seven years they're at an institution. For faculty on tenure-track lines, nearly everything they do is done either directly or indirectly with tenure in mind, whether it is work they do voluntarily or work that's assigned. But the tenure landscape is changing, and the pandemic seems to have accelerated that change. It's changing from the perspective of institutions, who see tenure as an arrangement that, for the most part, has no relevance in today's faster-paced world of hiring and downsizing, It's changing for faculty, too. An article in the Chronicle of Higher Education entitled Tenure's Broken Promise puts it this way, quote, As COVID-19 worsens the financial picture for many already vulnerable institutions, and as public sentiment against tenure grows, the possibility of losing it unceremoniously is looming larger and more frequently. Professors who have tenure lost it or never had it are looking with growing skepticism at this peculiar arrangement between the faculty and institutions, asking what it really means if it can't offer security, if it is worth the cost, and if it is still serving the larger good. End quote. Tenure is pretty unusual, often described as permanent lifetime employment, often a- inaccurately described that way. It is unusual in that the stakes are still high. Generally speaking, the tenure decision is permanent, and interestingly enough, it's fairly unequally distributed across institutions, across disciplines, and certainly across types of teachers. It's also getting rare, or rarer. Nearly 60% of academics in the 1970s were tenured, or on their way to tenure, and today it's about 30%. What's driven that? Well, primarily it's because higher education has come to depend to a much larger extent on part-time instruction, non-tenure track instruction, or adjunct instruction. The rise of tenure in the United States 
roughly coincides with the rise of the status of American higher education. Today, partly perhaps as a result of the tenure system, American higher education is the envy of the world. But times are changing. John Thielen, a leading historian of the higher education sector and a professor at the University of Kentucky, wrote in his book, A History of American Higher Education, quote, For a generation of new faculty members who enjoyed being hired under such circumstances, it was not difficult to imagine that such conditions were the norm. He later wrote, Economic abundance, however, provided little insight as to the political and legal protections professors would face in the future. End quote. There's no question that tenure has strengthened the American educational enterprise. The National Bureau of Economic Research has shown that tenure, ultimately through the longevity that it creates, perpetuates the permanence and stability of the American education system. Today, that permanence is often seen as the mere cultivation of conformity. Outside of higher education, tenure has become increasingly criticized. It creates a certain amount of inflexibility at institutions, both financially and programmatically, and paralleling criticisms levied at the tenure system in K-12 appears to occasionally preserve the employment of bad teachers. Now, full disclosure, I've been a tenured faculty member myself, and I've benefited from that system for quite a few years. I'm no longer a full-time faculty member, and as an administrator, I serve at the pleasure of the university. But for the first six years of my professional life, much of what I did was driven by the demands of the tenure evaluation process. In my role as the host of this podcast, I talk to a lot of faculty and administrators, and I'm not sure that I've talked to any about the tenure issue in the last six months that didn't include some concern that the tenure goalposts are shifting, shifting rapidly. For example, the most common complaint I hear are faculty who are expected, say, to present at conferences, but conferences aren't being held and they've received no guidance from their institution about how the tenure process will reflect that pause in that activity. That is a consequence of the pandemic. At any rate, You only need to read national publications, whether focused on academia or not, to see stories about changes in tenure. To help make sense of this, I contacted Colleen Flaherty, the faculty reporter for Inside Higher Ed. I asked Colleen to talk to me about a recently reported, rather extreme-seeming example of changes to tenure at John Carroll University, as well as the tenure landscape in general. Colleen, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. The sub-headline of your article suggested that John Carroll University fundamentally altered tenure. Now, can you explain the fundamental part? So uh, John Carroll University, a small um, Jesuit institution in Ohio, uh, delivered terminal contracts to two tenured professors of art history and cut the department altogether earlier this year without financial uh, declaring financial exigency. And that has not actually been unusual during the pandemic. But what is unusual and what turns out to be, you know, fundamentally different is that it is going farther than than uh, cutting that. And it is essentially introducing a new category of financial hardship into its policies that makes it easier to fire tenured faculty members than financial exigency. Now, many, if not most institutions still by their own policies need to declare financial exigency to lay off tenured faculty members for um, things other than cause or changes to the curriculum that faculty members have approved. Uh, But this is a really involved process as financial exigency involving layoffs usually means that uh, an entire department of tenured faculty members are going to be laid off. It involves... um, institutional promises typically to try to transfer as many faculty members as possible to another department or to retrain them, and sometimes opening up the books to the faculty. So again, it's not an easy process, and it's one that institutions do not uh, undertake often. So again, whereas financial exigency means a budget crisis that threatens an institution's survival, the lights are still on, but they might not be soon enough, 
John Carroll now says it can fire individual tenured faculty members without cause in cases of this new concept of budgetary hardship. And they're defining this not, again, as something that threatens the future of the the institution, but as a projected, not final, annual budget deficit of 6%, plus two more years of not guaranteed challenges, but foreseen financial challenges. Um, and so at the same time, finance, uh, John Carroll is de- it's denying faculty members the right to appeal these terminations, which is something different than financial exigency as well. Usually there are certain layers of appeal that faculty members have in financial exigency uh, policies and processes. So faculty members, ironically, though, at uh, John Carroll still do have certain protections under the more dire concept of financial exigency, which John Carroll is retaining alongside this new concept of budgetary hardship. And I, yeah, and the key, the key difference for faculty members essentially is that uh, in addition to making it possible to fire tenured faculty members for a less serious, even projected financial crisis, budgetary hardship means that they can go in and fire one or two or three or fa- uh, four faculty members versus a bunch of them in you know different departments that may be eliminated. And so to them, that opens up the potential for administrative abuse and political, you know, politically motivated personnel actions, which challenges for them the whole concept of tenure. Now, I'd like to return to that issue of the right to appeal. Uh, Your article says that John Carroll is denying faculty members the right to appeal these terminations. And if I understood your, your previous response correctly, there are situations in which they can appeal it, but they're narrow. My question is, I don't quite understand the process by which they can make this change. Is there a faculty union where the appeals process was, say, part of a contract? Does the right to appeal exist only within the university? Or are you also incorporating something that goes beyond just this faculty handbook? I'm trying to understand the scope of the faculty's rights at John Carroll. Okay, so maybe to start here, there is no faculty union at John Carroll. Most private institutions do not have faculty unions, especially for tenured and tenure track faculty members. And along with this new hardship policy, this financial hardship policy, uh, the stipulation that faculty members can't appeal was written into the John Carroll faculty handbook. Um, And so the faculty handbook is kind of like a contract. Uh, It's not necessarily, you know, legally considered a contract, but the institution will follow what is written in the handbook policy if and when it ever draws on this new financial hardship policy to get rid of individual faculty members. I'm just curious, do you know if the faculty had any input into the rewriting of that handbook statute before it happened or before it was released? Right. They had no uh, real input whatsoever. In fact, they tried to have input Uh, they suggested a few different things like making it easier for the university to temporarily lower their pay to deal with temporary financial hardship of the kind that is posed like, you know, by things like who knew COVID. Uh, but the university turned them down after a few kinds of similar proposals and eventually the board, uh, the governing board approved this administrative or the administration driven policy to incorporate this new term financial hardship into its you know, policies and procedures as codified in the faculty handbook. Where did that change originate from within the university, the, the board, the administration? Were you able to understand the, the process that resulted in this change? I think sometimes when things, I think the faculty members consider it to be a little bit of a mystery. Um, All I know, you know, essentially, and I think all that's sort of confirmed is that the board and the administration supported it. John Carroll told you that their new approach was modeled after other institutions. Did they give you examples of this? Were you able to confirm that? So I believe at the time that I asked for um, examples, uh, because they had referenced, the spokesperson had referenced to me um, that they were following, you know, models seen elsewhere. um, And... All the information that I got was that there were 12 other institutions that were doing uh, similar things. 
no specific uh, named institutions. Um, John Carroll also said that a uh, number of institutions, nine, in fact, they said are continue are, are considering making similar changes. I certainly haven't heard of this before. And the American Association of University Professors uh, basically did a, an audit of a bunch of different faculty handbooks in responding to the university's changes uh, on behalf of the faculty there. And they said that in our analysis of hundreds of faculty handbooks, this is the first time we have encountered this category. That might actually suggest the answer to my next question. And here I'm going to ask you to perhaps editorialize a little bit. Uh, Brent Brossman, I hope I'm saying that correctly, professor of communication and the faculty council president there, mm -hmm. said the board's explanation was, quote, mind boggling and said that, quote, Tenure is effectively done there. Uh, is he right? Um, well, actually, let me, before I answer that, go back to something else that the AAUP said in its response to John Carroll. It said a declaration of budgetary hardship would confer upon JCU's board and administration sweeping unilateral powers to close academic programs and or terminate tenured faculty appointments within those programs. Under AAUP-supported standards, the association said, and widely recognized academic norms, these are powers that may be exercised on financial grounds only through joint action with the faculty under conditions of bona fide financial exigency. And so, you know, the AAUP is essentially saying here that what JCU is, pro is proposing is and, and has adopted at this point is unprecedented. So I think in that uh, sense, it's mind boggling. And in the case of Brent Brossman, uh, it's personal to him as well. Uh, I was, you know, I was a bit sad actually talking to him because he said that he's a longtime professor who, you know, has volunteered for this, that and the other um, for years uh, for John Carroll. And he actually sent his own four children there as well. So he was kind of a cheerleader for the institution so that this is happening to his, you know, beloved you know, you know, college is is mind blogging to him, and I and I do believe when he says that. So more generally, though, I think that many people would agree with him when he says that tenure is effectively done because, and essentially, the the point of this new measure is that again, whereas financial exigency uh, is is a big formal process that tends to target uh, or you know, essentially facilitate layoffs of of many faculty members. Sometimes, let's say, within the closure of an entire department. Uh, John Carroll is actually promoting this new mechanism that it has as a scalpel-like tool, and that's a quote, scalpel, um, that, you know, essentially can target one or two faculty members. So it leaves the potential for administrators to target faculty members that they, you know, don't like, who have been critical of the administration, or who do controversial research essentially all of those things that tenure was really invented for. I talked to another professor of philosophy who, in some of her classes, discusses gender and the philosophy of sex. Um, that's in accordance with John Carroll's mandate to teach the whole person mind and soul. Um, so she's not trying to be controversial. She, she sees it as part of her particular job at John Carroll. Uh, but she said that doing this kind of work is going to be really challenging now because she could potentially be targeted for saying something that a student finds controversial and reports her for. And nowadays, not just at John Carroll, I do think it's on you know faculty members' minds that their one or two student complaints, you know, potentially away from unemployment. The environment for teaching is extremely political right now. And the statement from AAUP that you quoted also seem to draw a critical distinction in that financial exigency is a joint action or decision between the faculty and the administration. And that seems to be absent here. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was, you know, essentially uh, financial exigency has these strict um, financial parameters for what actually you know constitutes it. Um, and it does it is supposed to involve the faculty sometimes you know often actually i would say that in cases of financial exigency policies say that faculty members are supposed to be shown the book so they can understand and judge the financial precarity for themselves and then any curricular reform that is you know that results from these layoffs or restructuring the faculty member is supposed to be their faculty members are supposed to be leading that 
But at John Carroll, what this new mechanism is, is, um, you know, a 6% projected budget deficit, plus two more years of thinking that things are going to be bad. And you can go in and you can target not ju- not an entire department for, you know, sort of program reasons, low enrollments or something like that. You could potentially without stating your reason at all, go in and target, uh, you know, eliminate one, two or three faculty members. So in that faculty members see the door for administrative um, abuse or political personnel actions. Well, you're the faculty reporter. So you must talk to faculty at many institutions. You cover many institution issues. What are you seeing elsewhere with regard to tenure? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot. I mean, there, there's a lot on this, uh, you know, kind of subbeat right now. Um, John Carroll is the only place I've seen come up with this new codified policy for laying off faculty members in cases other than financial exigency. So literally making up a new category. But we have seen during COVID dozens of other institutions laying off even tenured faculty members saying that COVID is the reason but without declaring financial exigency. And I think outside of COVID, that would be a lot harder for institutions to do. So the AAUP is actually currently investigating a half dozen or so of these institutions. um, And it has been warning of the potential for this really since March 2020, because it says something similar happened during Hurricane Katrina in the New Orleans area with institutions in AAUP's view playing fast and loose with tenure and using the natural disaster of Katrina to deal with not immediate financial issues caused by the hurricane, but more long-standing financial kind of festering. That foreshadows my final question for you. Um, it appears to me that there's significantly more discussion of tenure during the pandemic. And I'm curious, how much do you attribute to the consequences of the pandemic. So like I see discussions that some are individual institutions discussing tenure. Others are more general where people are talking about how to ensure the survival of their institution or of their sector. And they bring up tenure as something that stands in its way. Others are members of the public, many of whom have lost their jobs. And the idea of that sort of um, security of employment that tenure represents kind of gets under their skin. I'm curious sort of what you've seen as the pandemic has unfolded. So I would say that discussions about tenure or the decline of tenure in particular were happening well before COVID. But COVID is definitely an accelerant. Uh, For example, many places instituted hiring freezes last year, so we're going to have fewer professors come on board this year, potentially next. Um, And who knows when or if those lines will be restored in many places. And then the main administrative argument against tenure that I hear is that it prevents the university from being nimble and responding to the kind of financial challenges that we saw during COVID that we are seeing. And so... What I would say is that um, what I am not hearing a lot about right now, but that may potentially come up in uh, you know future conversations about this, is um, potentially restoring some faculty lines you know, amid this uncertainty in the form of full time contracts uh, for faculty members. Uh, you know, on a multi year basis, written into which are strong assurances of academic freedom, and then one other thing that I would say is that uh, just what makes all of this so difficult is that all these conversations, um, you know, about the decline of tenure are so especially painful right now, because this is coming after a year of professors doing the hardest work of their lives. And so, you know, I think the faculty members, um, I could hear in their voices, a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning of the pandemic, fatigue, certainly, but, you know, enthusiasm for getting their students through the semester. And as it's gone on, of course, uh, you know, the first semester, I mean, you know, in March 2020, and as the pandemic has lagged on, uh, faculty members are, of course, tired. But I think there's something else, uh, you know, kind of working and it's that they see in so many places their, you know, valiant efforts are being rewarded with 
the, you know, the continued decline of tenure, sometimes on their campuses, the accelerated decline of tenure. And so, you know, it's just kind of another layer to this very, very difficult position that academia is in right now with respect to tenure. Just as a follow-up question, you know, when I talk to people about tenure, there are many people who acknowledge that it has its shortcomings. Um, And I've noticed that the conversation often goes in a particular direction. People who acknowledge its shortcomings, uh, even faculty, uh, will say ultimately, however, that because it's so widespread, without tenure, you can't be competitive from a hiring standpoint. Right. No, and, and I and I hear that as well. I mean, whenever there are cuts to, uh, you know, tenure lines or faculty layoffs, I mean, faculty members will always, you know, say that how, how is this supposed to protect the institution when it's going to significantly undercut our ability to attract the best talent? Colleen Flaherty, faculty reporter for Inside Higher Education. Thanks for being on the podcast. Uh, Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, These are important issues. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. Please feel free to email me with questions, comments, or suggestions for content that you'd like to hear about. You can reach me at mortarboardpodcast at gmail.com. Consider stopping by my blog, mortarboardblog.com. The blog contains links to stories that I think will interest you, podcast transcripts, and articles I've written. You can also like me on Facebook at Dr. Daniel Barwick or follow me on Twitter at Daniel Barwick. Looking forward to talking with you in the next episode.